and then the, the actual or physical classroom, um, I think that the methodology is still the same in that, uh, again, it's, it's great if you have a huge amount of technical knowledge, but if you don't have a way to you know, formulate that and put it down and make it uh, work for you and for a viewer, then I think it, it kind of becomes um, stilted. So uh, that's one thing I, I always try to make sure that the two halves um, really resonate for the student, the technical uh, and the, the, the knowledge side or the information-based. Uh, for teaching online, um, that's something that I also make sure that I try to um, show. It, I think or I did my best to try to present the workshop that way um, in giving you uh, or giving uh, the viewer the, the drawing and then the reasoned explanation because um, I think that that's something that's really, really valuable. Um, I think I see a lot of you know, concept artists and designers that it's always like the same 12 historical references. You know, there's like the sergeant, then there's, you know, the same, same, same. And it's, it never changes. So one thing that I always try to do for my students is um, online or physical in space classroom is make sure that they have a really broadened, wealthy background of um, experience and reference and knowledge to bring to their drawing, um, anatomy and historical. And then also that they have the fundamental skills that I think are necessary for starting out. Um, and I try to make it objective. You know, I don't, I really don't try to push a style. I try to really take stuff that I think is um, you know, general, agreed upon, um, base level competency and work that I see and give it as a foundation. Um, and I try to also make this clear in the book that you know, I think it's enough of a foundation for stylistic exploration and personalization to take place on top of or with. Um, and I think that as a core philosophy, that that would be something that I would make sure came through in either online or um, I know I practice that in class. Okay, thanks for that, Michael. And again, everyone, um, please check back on our site for any future updates concerning the master classes. Where we'll be posting um, the, the future roster as far as instructors and classes and everything related to that. Um, our next question is from Miguel. Um, he says it's a two-part question. First, he asks, how important are figure drawing classes in general, and what do you recommend doing in class students can't, for students who can't attend those? How important are figure drawing classes? Um, yes. For me, uh, I, think, I think that'll just depend. I mean, I, don't, I think it will depend on what your interests are. Um, I would never generalize and say that, you know, oh, without a figure drawing class that, you know, that that's it. You, know, you, just, you should hang it up. Because uh, I just don't think that that's true. Um, I think it's really helpful for some people. Um, for me, it's just what I gravitated to as a student. Um, you know, I, I really just enjoyed it. It was all from the first time I sat down. You know, one of the most you know, complex and also frustrating um, things I'd ever done, and it just really drew me in. Um, but I think that it's just important to be attentive to, um, you know, what your interests and where they lead you, uh, to make sure that your studies go in a positive kind of inspired way. Um, but that being said, I think that you can build the same foundation level of skills doing anything uh, as long as you're, you're conscious and you know, intelligent about what it is you're trying to develop uh, artistically, why, and you know, do your research on some of the best ways that other people are developing those same skill sets. Um, if you don't have access to a figure drawing, uh, classroom or environment, um, again, I don't, I don't think that that's, you know, the worst thing ever. I mean, you can also just develop those same skills, like I said, in any number of ways. Um, I think that maybe there's just a lot of tradition uh, that people you know, like about having the figure drawing classes. Did that answer both parts? I believe so. Um, okay. And he, he says, yeah, thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, our next question, he says, thanks a lot. Um, our uh, next question is from Todd. Todd asks, uh, or more, more of a request actually, could you list a few of the not so well, uh, well, he says, could you list a few not so well known great artists to check out? Oh, um, I get to list you a ton. It doesn't, anything in particular, uh, I don't want to list you weird abstract artists that you would, you want to punch me in the head for recommending to you. So Todd, if you heard that, uh, please give us a specific uh, category or such that you would want him to give some names to. Um, 
In the meantime, we have uh, another question basically asking what are your, or who are your greatest mentors? Um, um, it always changes, and I think that it's good to change. I don't, what I was never attracted to uh, as a student is, um, is that reverent, um, you know, really like endearing, um, you know, one student to one teacher um, mentorship. Um, that's something I always thought was kind of weird. And um, and I, I didn't I mean it has a weird kind of disciple uh, quality to it, and I never really thought that the students that practice that kind of religious devotion to one teacher or style is really was really ever that interesting. So I'm kind of irreverent in that sense. Um, you know, as I went through school, I had I tr I tried to study with every person in Southern California that I thought you know was interesting. Um, so you know, earliest teacher that you know I continue to come back to, whether it was in classes or literature, was um, Glenn Vilpu, a great teacher, um, and very generous. And by that I mean that he's very articulate, his ideas are very um, open, uh, he doesn't you know, make it any type of mystery as to what he's doing, and that's something I always appreciated, was that you know, objective transfer and presentation of information. Um, but it's not limited to me for you know, people I had access to. I also just was really ravenous uh, and interested in historical people and I would really get like immersed in an artist and get all the books that I could on any one and then read them all and then I would you know lose interest and then it would be time for the next one and then I think doing that would really bring out a lot of um, you know, questions for you as an artist and also allow you to you know, really build a, you know, a deep complex relationship with the tradition of art and art history so I mean Cezanne Gerhard Richter, Rubens, you know, there's just no, I don't have any one specific period in time that I, you know, like I don't just like pre-Raphaelite art or just don't like, you know, British portraiture. Like I try to not just be in a specific historical period because uh, I think you can get stale doing that. And the same thing with teachers. I, mean, I don't think that you should have you know, one type of teacher that you only listen to. Um, I think that the best kind of artistic results come from that really um, more um, schizophrenic relationship to information and, and source. Wow, thank you, Michael. Um, our next question is from, I believe, well, actually, uh, Todd followed up with a response. He, in relationship to his uh, question about, can you list uh, a few of the not so well known great artists to check out. He says something to help the figure. I suppose since that's uh, you know something related to I guess figure drawing. Oh, that's what we're checking out. Maybe a couple Orientalist artists. Hmm. Uh, well, I don't. I don't have a huge background. Um, definitely not one you know, developed enough to give you obscure um, Orientalist artists. Um, most of my you know study has been more Western um, and for you know different figure um, specifically um, I like a lot of contemporary painting so like uh, for people that are interested in the figure and what people are doing with it today which I think is really important because again going back to the idea of history you don't want to just get like locked into what Sargent was doing with figures because I mean how difficult is that really to relate to or you know Rubens in, in contemporary times um, so I think it's I always make sure to tell my students that you know, the figure is something that, again, it's a vehicle, um, and you should be looking at all periods. So today, um, look at John Curran, look at Jenny Seville, um, look at Daniel Richter, look at Gerhardt Richter, um, and I think that's more like in the fine art um, or you know figurative painting um, side of things. Uh, and what I appreciate about a lot of those artists is their ability to distort and change and warp the figure for um, their ideas, to, to suit their ideas. And so that might be a great list or collection of artist names to also let you know that you know, my interest isn't to be kind of machine-like in my presentation and drawing of anatomy and, and structure and perspective and all those different things that I, I really do honestly believe in that as a departure point into the figure as a, as a vehicle for the presentation of your, your thoughts and ideas. Um, you know, other than that, I think I would only really be able to pull out, um, you know, the more kind of known ones. Um, but 
Um, Thomas Eakins is good going back 